When we look at this conflict in Gaza, this conflict started on October 7th. It was intelligence failure. It was permitted by the Netanyahu administration. How do you see this event on October 7th? Yeah, well, on the actual day, hearing the news, it seemed a surprise because most Americans are not following closely what's happening in Israel on the ground or even politically. So, um, you know, it seems surprising. Shortly thereafter, the attack, we hear that the military was far, far away from the southern border. Um, and the response time was slow, which for a small country like Israel that is surrounded by enemies that has a very militaristic um, perspective on its uh, the role of its citizens and the dangers to its citizens. I mean, that's how Israel is. Uh, the, you know, the, the society is um, nervous and, and thinking about possibilities of harm being done to them. So that seemed very strange. Um, and then later, of course, what it what we have found out, even in the Western media, even in The New York Times, we're, we're uh, finding out that uh, they had plenty of warning. In fact, right afterwards, we heard that Egypt had tried to warn uh, their counterparts in, in Israel intelligence, but um, uh, that it didn't work. Um, nobody paid attention to it. And then later we find out that um, they they actually were quite aware, the government of Israel, the, certainly the intelligence uh, uh, agencies of Israel were, were very much aware that something was going to happen. And, they, and the normal response should have been, and this is what the Israeli, the Israelis themselves believe, that the normal response, if you think something's going to happen, you beef up and you prepare for it and you you warn people, you know, you do the normal things to, to protect your population. None of that was done. And, um, you know, so uh, that that is curious. And, and again, immediately after it happened on October 7th, immediately we got the 9-11 comparisons. I mean, it was like, oh, this is our 9-11. This is our 9-11. And um, that's that's not really good for people that know much about 9-11, <laughs> because in 9-11, we had very much the same uh, warnings and advanced knowledge and um, didn't follow our own procedures very well. You know, our response time on 9-11 to uh, intercept airplanes or whatever was was abnormally slow or non-existent. It, it, it is comparable to 9-11, but not in, a, not in the way I think that they were hoping. It's comparable in the way that here you have a government that um, is kind of engineering a situation that will allow it to pursue a pre-planned uh, activity, or agenda, and of course, I think in, in Israel's case, that agenda was to uh, eliminate Gaza as a as a home for Palestinians, which is, I think, is what they're doing. How was the relationship between the Israelis and Hamas all these years? It's pretty well known, and Israelis know it better than Americans do. But uh, Bibi Netanyahu himself was in a previous government, in a previous government role that he had. I think as prime minister before, um, actually supported Hamas as a balance out, um, I guess, uh, the, the uh, now I forget the other one, the other group that they're balancing, now it's the Palestinian Authority or it was another terrorist group, but- Hezbollah? Um, Hezbollah, yeah. So Hezbollah being the pro-Iranian side of things, they say, well, we'll have a Sunni, we'll have a Sunni so they can balance out the Shia. This, this makes sense if you're sitting in an office or you're sitting in a library and you're talking intellectually about what you might do. In reality, of course, they, they uh, uh, as it always happens when we create uh, an enemy of our enemy and we foster that as part of our strategy, it almost always it almost always backs backfires. And you know, we have uh, we saw this again uh, with with our own experience in Afghanistan and with Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS. Of course, uh, in fact, it all comes full circle. And they say, well, the U.S. created ISIS. Well, yeah, and we also kind of created the prior to ISIS. Al Qaeda and prior to Al Qaeda, we fostered the relationship with bin Laden because he was going to fight the Russians in Afghanistan with us, you know, and this was a great thing. So when you when you um, conduct foreign policy in a narrow minded way uh, that's not related to historical reality and you don't consider the risks because it sounds like, hey, we can do this on the cheap. You know, we can we can uh, support this group here and people won't find out and it'll be fine. And then we can always control them. You can't control them. And uh, you can never control them. It's uh, they're human beings. They they're people with lives. They're organizations with agendas, just like government, just like our government has an agenda, just like Israel has an agenda. These organizations have agendas, and they operate um, in their own interests. So uh, this idea that you can own, you can create, like Bibi Netanyahu, he creates 
and fosters and supports the idea, oh, Hamas will be great. Well, you're either controlling them or you're not. Um, and that is a question because if he was controlling them and allowed October 7th to happen actually by design as opposed to by neglect, um, that is a really bad problem. And and he will, uh, if that could be proven, of course, uh, he I don't think he'd make it to trial. I think he'd be you know, beaten to death in the streets. But um, I don't know if they can prove that that happened. And I don't know if that's what happened. But um, certainly it is a valid uh, theory to look at because it wouldn't be unprecedented to, um, you know, to, to have an organization that you have communication lines with and uh, you work together to get something that you want. And of course, if you say this, you say, well, what is it that Israel wants? And um, I don't know what Israel wants. We can talk a little bit about what the Netanyahu government wants because um, they've said they've been quite open. They've been, they've been quite vocal, um, very clear with what they envision for Gaza. And, and we're not seeing it in, a, in the US because we're trying to not, we don't want to hear that because um, that would incite the anti-Israel rage that's global even more. But the fact is the Israelis in their bubble have been very open about what it is the government intends for Gaza. And they are proceeding uh, in, in a somewhat rapid way because uh, you know they don't have reporters in Gaza. They've pretty much, if you're a reporter in Gaza, you're, you and your family will be killed. I think that's the message that has been uh, sent and it has been done. I mean, they have the number of reporters uh, and their families killed in killed in Gaza, not just bef before this and after October 7th is um, a statistically significant, let's say, because we know journalists are killed around the world, but in Gaza and uh, pro uh, Palestinian journalists are specifically uh, targeted. And, and I I don't know if the government of Israel denies this or accepts it, but I think the evidence is there that, that they do. So that we're not getting we're not getting the kind of uh, reporting from Gaza inside imagery. I think the internet was shut down just uh, again for a, a you know they've they've gone further south as of uh, this morning or as of this weekend, and um, so the internet shut down. So even your average person who may have a working cell phone is not able to you know uh, communicate. The, the information is not getting out. So when it comes out. In, in more volume and more detail, which ultimately it will, ultimately many things will come out. The Israelis, I think, hope that it will be done with, that they will already have Gaza. The refugees that they've created will be um, corralled somewhere. I don't know, I don't know what the vision is. I don't think, I don't think uh, Israel cares if they live or die. I think that's, um, unfortunately, their actions are communicating that they absolutely do not care if the people in Gaza live or die. So if they live in a tent on the Egypt side, or if they live somewhere in the desert in a in a open air, you know, refugee place surrounded by Israelis, um, I don't think they really care about that. It, it's they want them off of Gaza and they want Gaza, they want that strip, and I think they've wanted it for a long time. And I think they've sold the idea to themselves in their. Uh, in their leadership meetings and in their intelligence, their their theory of Israel, however, the people that say, what is Israel about? And they don't they don't want two fronts to fight. It'd be preferable if they could just we we have a border with Egypt and then we can worry about Jordan separately. And that's where, you know, they're they're doing quite well in the West Bank and Israel taking property. I mean, they've they've divided it up so much and uh, infiltrated, I guess, um in terms of uh settlements and that kind of thing, which haven't stopped. I mean, Bibi is known for this. You know, he his his many years as prime minister, not certainly not the only one that supported it, but he's been very much a friend of the settlement. So I think they have a different plan for the Jordan side, um, but certainly Gaza appears smaller. It's, it is a lot of people, 2.3 million people is a lot of people, but they're, they're impoverished. Um, they have been impoverished for uh, generations uh, on purpose, you know, and and uh, and they're also held in great contempt by most Israelis, um, which is makes it easy to kill them, makes them easy to, uh, you know, to to hurt them. It, it it doesn't matter if if these people die. It doesn't matter if they have no home. Uh, you know, I think this fits in with what the uh, Israeli government agenda is, and and if I don't know if people look at governments and think somehow that they 
are wiser than your average person, but they're not. And, and our own government in the U.S. is very much an example. How many stupid things does our government do on a daily basis? Um, they don't represent the best and the brightest. Um, no government really does. It's, it's, I'm sorry to say, scum rises to the top. So the Israeli government is not really serving Israel's future very well. But in their minds, they are doing something that they have wanted to do, and they believe that it will make them winners if they do this. And so I think I think that's what's motivating the whole thing. Are we learning anything from those experiences in Iraq, in Afghanistan? We had Al-Qaeda, Taliban. We had ISIS after that, even worse than Al-Qaeda. It doesn't look like we're learning anything about it. Um, and I can't say what the Israelis are learning because the United States is filled with people that don't know much about the Middle East. And most Americans don't pay close attention to that. It's, it's a foreign policy that is far removed from our day-to-day -day lives. So our government can do things that we don't even know about. Are they learning? I don't know. But we do have a political way of punishing uh, certain uh certain patterns of foreign policy and the neoconservatives people are very people are sick of them in the united states okay and this is why uh, trump was elected and it was also why so much energy was put into defeating him in 2020 and preventing him from even showing up on the ballot in uh, 2024 so he but but what is he representing he is representing a position in the country, which is both Democrats and Republicans and independents, that is very tired of a really stupid foreign policy that doesn't seem to be learning from its mistakes. So that's pretty much how Americans can communicate that we are we don't think our government is really learning from its mistakes. So th there is that. However, Israel is uh, much smaller. It's in the middle of the Middle East. Of course, um, the Mossad is everywhere. Uh, it has infiltrated and co-opted. It's a very wealthy country. It is able to purchase. Um, it is able to fund uh, so many things in a, in a much more rich and complex way than we can do it. So our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan are disastrous. But part of that is we don't know what we're doing. We never do in, in these foreign places. Um, and and we, we do make mistakes because we have a small number of idiots running our country who who imagine that they know how to impact things and they don't. But in Israel, um, there is much more investment in how to manipulate, how to manipulate your neighbors, how to deal with your neighbors, how to, you know, they, they have contempt. Many of the people in the Israeli government and many Israelis have contempt for um, Persians, have contempt for Arabs, have contempt for Turks, you know, have contempt for all Gentiles, whatever. But they also uh, do understand many things about how to deal. And so they're not really constrained. Uh, they can, forming Hamas, I'm sure that there's many positives in their own, when they look at what's good about Hamas and what we did in supporting them and forming them and what's bad about it. And I'm sure they put October 7th, maybe, in the bad side. But there are many things, I think, from a Mossad point of view or from an Israeli point of view, that Hamas has helped with. And they can, of course, you can't rewrite history, but so many times we say, oh, well, if it wasn't for Hamas, this would have happened. We, we would have had a unified Palestinian movement. And then where would we be, right? So I think they justify what we would call, what an outside observer or an inside observer would say, that's a mistake. I'm not sure they view it as mistakes. I think they view it as the way of conducting a continual war. Um, and of course, I think every, you know, deception is a big part of it. Um, allies and uh, how much you tell them, what you tell them, how loyal or disloyal you might be to those allies. All of this is part of war fighting. These are tools. And I think that's how the Israeli government looks at them. Um, unfortunately, what they're not looking at is what it does to Israel itself, what it does to Israelis. Um, you know, it, it's a country that uh, has really chosen war for its people. It's chosen war as the way we will be unified. We are we are in a country. We are a country of, surrounded by enemies, and we choose war, and we will be the victors, and we will be the Spartans, and all everybody will serve the military. But you know, and and we. We found this out a little bit with Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, we sent some of the same guys and gals 
to repeated tours in Iraq, repeated tours in Afghanistan, sometimes repeated tours in Syria. And these guys came back, many of them scarred, mentally scarred. Uh, of course, a lot of them came back physically scarred. There's that. But the mental scarring, the, the uh, moral and ethical challenges that they faced and failed in many cases in their own minds and legitimately bad things that they did, um, they're broken people. And they've come back to the country and they are broken people. Their families know it. Their friends know it. Um, if they have contact with them, they understand why they're like that. And guess what? Their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, their nieces and nephews, they don't want to go do what Uncle Joe did because Uncle Joe's messed up. You know, Uncle Joe's on drugs. Uncle Joe's suicidal. Uncle Joe lives on the streets. Why? Because he was sent somewhere to do some bad, evil things to people that really were not uh, morally or ethically justified. This is a problem with all wars, but it's particularly a problem when you send people to wars that don't make that don't need to happen. These these uh, chosen wars, and I think all of Israel, they choose war, and they're destroying their population because all the good things about Israel, all the good things about being Jewish, you know, all of the good things about even the the global Jewry, you know, the. Uh, a diaspora, all of those good positive things are subordinated to killing. They're subordinated to war. And um, this is not good. This is not what people need for their health of their souls. It's not a good path to make your country prosperous because war, of course, sucks huge amounts of resources, not just human resources, but money. It diverts resources that could be used to do great things. Now, you know, we give Israel and the United States, I think, 3.8 billion a year, and they spend it on American weapons. And some of it's straight up donations. And then they also receive money from uh, uh, non-Israeli Jewish interested people who, who love Israel, and they send money. And so Israel fights these. They, they do what they do. They live in this war state. They, they create war. Now, they, to them, it's like other people are creating war. They're attacking us. See, they've attacked us. But really, they've created every opportunity for that, including October 7th. I think when the truth comes out with October 7th, we will see that that was, that was a uh, planned temptation to get something. But if all that money dried up from outside, could Israel fight? Could Israel be the state, the military and militarized state that it is? Um, and, and would it want to be? Um, I don't know, but but we are in America, we are, of course, very much closely tied with Israel because we fund it. In fact, it's ludicrous to me how our, our uh, president, vice president, the, the American policymakers are like, uh, uh, you know, we, we, Israel has a meet. They say, oh, don't don't kill civilians. But what's the first thing we did? The first thing we did is open up the, the war spigots. Immediately, we have to 11.8 billion or whatever more. Uh, immediately, bunker buster bombs have to be delivered. Immediately, our two carrier battle groups have to go into the region. Um, so our actions say we are encouraging them in this. And that's not what a friend does. So it, it, many Israelis are wise to uh, not see the United States as their friend and ally because we are not. Um, there's there's money we're making and we like that. but But we're not... Truly, we're not helping Israel by loading it up with weapons and giving it top cover for whatever things it wants to do. We're not helping it, and they're not helping themselves. Um, it's it's not a good long term uh, survival path to continually fight with your neighbors, to continually hate everyone around you, uh, to despise them almost in a way that many people say is racist, which it does have the same characteristics as racism. You know, we're sensitive to racism in this country. We hear about it all the time. We have a long history. We know um, you, you don't build a state on racism, um, but they have they're, they're leaning in that way. And that is also the result of a war mentality. I mean, when we fought in the United States, we didn't want to join the First World War, but we did. And what's the, one of the first things we did? Well, we threw uh, Germans. <laughs> you know, we arrested a bunch of Germans and threw them in prisons and held them there until World War One was over. We did the same thing with J Japanese and Germans in uh, uh, World War II. So when your country is at war, you can do some pretty um, immoral and brutal things based on fear and hatred and racism. 
and every every country that's participated in it has the same pattern you know this this is the war is is like opens the door to so many evil bad things that are not good not just not good for peace they're not good for survival of a country so israel is uh, being pushed and supported and egged on in many ways by the united states and others uh and this is not good for israel at all if you put yourself in netanyahu's shoes what could have been a smart response to that attack of hamas well it's hard to be in bibi netanyahu's shoes i would need to be a criminal okay i would need to be a guy that is uh just about getting ready to be put in prison and kicked off of my position as prime minister um that's very different than a normal prime minister that has the support of many people and many parties uh he was in a vulnerable place when you're in a vulnerable place you have to show strength so i don't know you know what choices he had because he was so vulnerable uh you know if he's a true patriot he would sacrifice his career what i think i would have done and i like to think that i would have done this had i been him even if i was truly him truly a criminal truly politically vulnerable i think i would say this is my fault and i'm surprised he didn't say that but i well i'm not surprised cuz he was so vulnerable and you can't show weakness when you're vulnerable but i think he should have said uh i let this happen i don't know how we did this this is a mistake we weren't prepared it's on me um obviously it's got to go after hamas but i think they can't lie about hamas we have they have good communications with hamas if they want to take out hamas people <laughs> and they can get people to take them out in qatar they they can go get them where they are these leaders and take them out and they, they haven't done that so again this tells me he's still tight with them uh this is a this is a charade in many ways to allow israel at this certain time and place when the us is really in a bad position to act because we have an election coming up we have this terrible degradation of ukraine uh where the country is bank- our country is bankrupt so now's the best time for israel to act in such a way um and hamas actually has helped make that possible so um i w- i would not be surprised if he still has open lines with hamas not just in terms of trading hostages but in terms of long term strategy um what he should have done though and what i think i would have done is is uh at least stood up and been responsible for it and it's possible the rage of the israeli people would have probably said you know they they probably wouldn't have changed horses in the middle of the race they would have said okay at least you took responsibility now let's go uh you know go after hamas now israel is good at going after people um that it needs to go after around the world uh I, I, you know the 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 uh, munich uh olympics you know that made lots of books and movies about that but i'm sure that's just one example but um if they truly wanted to eliminate any terrorist group or any leader of a terrorist group they could have done it we saw much the same thing in our own uh, so-called search for uh, bin laden you know i think it's he was reported that we killed him three different times under three different presidents so whatever um well two obama i think finally got him but by, but bush had killed him twice so this idea of having uh this enemy out there is still politically useful um and i think maybe that's part of what this is so uh i don't know if that's a good answer but I, I was surprised he didn't show more man manliness um and kind of the father of israel kind of situation you know i i i am responsible because he denied it uh, he very much was uh, he looked weak i thought because he did say oh we didn't do anything wrong and of course later of course the facts always come out of course they did many things wrong the relationship between israel and these arab states that are surrounding israel it's so important before responding to hamas they have to take into account what would be the influence of this attacking on gaza on their relationship with other arab states with turkey it seems mm-hmm. to me that the netanyahu administration just destroyed everything secretary austin the the department of defense guy our secretary of defense, defense he made a statement last week um that they were making a strategic israel was making strategic and a strategic error in the way that they were conducting this uh total destruction of of gaza and i think the planned elimination elimination of of gazans of palestinians that live in gaza 
And he was, he said, this is a strategic mistake. And immediately our congressmen get on the TV or our senators and say, oh, uh, he, he's not, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But what, what it is, is he does know what he's talking about. And he is speaking of this long-term um, survival. There are stock, there's, Netanyahu is sacrificing many gains that he had made and his other Israeli leaders had made in relations with the neighbors. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you one that jumps out at you, of course, is um, not not an Arab neighbor, but Turkey, because for many years, um, Israel and Turkey were moving closer. They were helping each other with um, some of their terrorist issues, uh, Kurdistan. They were also doing quite a bit of trade. Uh, there were some joint projects, I believe. And um, this, this action by Netanyahu threw all of that into the toilet. And you have um, Turkey, uh, the, the, the uh, Erdogan is, you know, leading protests in support of Palestinians, anti-Israel. He He's named in uh, NATO meetings. He has called Netanyahu a war criminal that will be tried and he will he will make sure he's I mean, that's some strong language. I don't know if, if he'll follow through, but it didn't take long to destroy what probably 25 years of work by diplomats and, and businessmen and all kinds of things to, to bring Turkey and Israel closer together. So they just threw that away. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia has been trying to be everybody's friend, I guess, because they are, you know, they had just recently um, made some really amazing openings with, with Iran, which they should do since they're next door neighbor. Um, but they also had been doing some very positive uh, work at least from an Israeli point of view, I think, with Israel. And where's that? That they, They're spitting on that. Um, Qatar, I can't say. I mean, uh, I, they've been very quiet. I mean, I don't know what the Qataris leaders or the Qataris are, are thinking about is in terms of that, because, uh, you know, it's hard to say. But, um, and of course, Iraq is still a nation we destroyed that is struggling to find itself. This angers Iraqis. Um, this angers, I mean, you know, uh, one of the I saw one of the commentators early on after October seventh said, "Looks like uh, uh, Israel has done the impossible. They have united the entire Middle East against them." And um, how did they do that? Why would they do that? Um, it is it is possible because you know we say our, we we think our political leaders are smart and wise, but they're not. Bibi was under incredible pressure both for his legacy, his immediate job, and possibility of fines and jail. This is his, this was facing him. It may be that he put his own political survival in his, as he saw it and the and ability to postpone jail time. Um, he, he, that was more important to him than what Israel had achieved in terms of friendly relations with their neighbors uh, over many years. And I wouldn't say they're super friendly, but a little bit friendly is better than a little bit warlike. So, it was a positive thing and he threw all that away. I don't know, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Although it does when you consider that um, they have pretty much acknowledged at this point that, that they have nuclear weapons. And we knew that of course, that's been known for a long time that Israel has them. Um, but again, that opens another can of worms because you have nuclear weapons. Okay, well, we need the IAEA to come in and inspect because that's how it works. And how come you haven't signed on to a non-proliferation treaty? These are issues that now are problems for Israel. They had avoided it. So none of it makes good uh, political sense to a normal person, but I think maybe his right-wing government and him, and Bibi himself, um, they believe their own propaganda that if they can just kill the Palestinians, that that problem will go away. That's not the, that's not the answer. You can't kill people and hope that it, the problem goes away because the problem you have with people is you. You know, if, if everywhere you go, you have a problem, you know, uh, maybe you're the problem. And uh, so they don't I don't think uh, the Israeli government certainly has any uh, introspective or self-awareness capability. Um, you know, everybody lives in their own bubble and they certainly live in a bubble uh, that. Uh, makes their citizens very vulnerable and it makes their economy vulnerable too. I mean, uh, you know, every, all countries, you want to be successful, you want to trade and who's going to, you know, who's going to buy Israel. You think they're all worried about an American program to uh, 
um, what is the program called? You know what I'm talking about, where they don't buy Israeli made goods. It's like a boycott. And, and they were uh, all government contractors have to sign. You know, all employees have to swear they weren't part of this boycott thing. Very, It was very nerve wracking for the Israelis. They said, we can't have people not buying our goods. This is this is the way of prosperity. This is the way of peace is to sell goods. And um, they were very upset about that. And yet they do this. So three quarters of the world's not going to buy Israeli products. And that includes their weapons, which they make a lot of money on. Um, so uh, and certainly we don't we're not going to buy them. That's our United States is broke. <laughs> you know, we got our own problems. I think uh, this idea or if we buy them, we buy them with dollars that are so inflated that the whole rest of the world rapid just continues its de-dollarization, uh, which is smart for them to do. Um, I don't I don't know what they're gambling on. Maybe they. I mean, maybe they're going to kill them all. But in the news today, um, you you might have seen it too. Also, um, they, they're talking about oh, we have pumps set up. We can flood the underground tunnels in Gaza with seawater. Okay, which also contaminates the entire southern part of that aquifer. But that's not uh, you know it it makes the place unlivable, um, which is their intent. How does this benefit Israel to do this? And I just I just don't. It seems so self-destructive and they don't see it as self-destructive. They say we're killing our enemies and their enemies are subhuman. In fact, even Americans call Palestinians subhuman. And I'm going to tell you, I was listening to a Mark Levine radio show. He's a right wing guy, he talks about the Constitution, but clearly doesn't understand what's in it. But he um, he was upset on Thursday night, a couple, I guess, four days ago, five days ago. And he was very upset about anti-Israel protests and um, he said, yes, Palestinians are unhuman. They're inhuman. They're subhuman. Subhuman is the word he actually used, subhuman. So this is the language of slaughter. It's the language of genocide. Um, and, and we've heard it before historically. We've condemned it historically, although we're not allowed now to condemn it. But it will be condemned. It's being condemned globally. But it will, ultimately, the Americans will condemn it. Our government will condemn it. And the next government the post Netanyahu government will condemn it also. Um, they must, uh, otherwise they are the global pariahs. They'll sell no goods anywhere. Nobody will deal with them. And um, their security will be reduced instead of increased as a result of what they're done. But I think that's the strategic, I'm putting words in Secretary Austin's mouth, but I think when he says strategic error, uh, this is what he's talking about. Netanyahu recently had a conversation with Elon Musk on X, he was mm -hmm. talking about the Israeli strategy in Gaza. He said that we want to destroy Hamas. We want to rebuild Gaza. We want to change the mindset of the population in Gaza. Do you think with this type of behavior that the Netanyahu administration is committing in Gaza, is that possible? You know, he when he speaks in, when he speaks in English, I assume he was, I didn't watch that. Um, actually, I did tune into it for a little bit, but I didn't listen to the whole thing. But he speaks in English when he's speaking to an American audience, because Netanyahu, I think, went to school here. I think he grew up here. Um, so he's speaking. So already he is targeting his his language to what he perceives to be the Western audience. Um, increasingly, what we're finding is what they what Netanyahu and some of his other folks say in English is not at all what they say in Hebrew. Not at all. Um, it is, uh, you know, this is to calm you guys down over here in America, all you people with your, you know, you don't want to be racist and you want to have peace everywhere. Of course, we, our government doesn't like peace any more than, you know, Tel Aviv does. But, you know, you, your people, are con you're concerned, you're, you're, what is, what do they call it? Diversity, equity, inclusive. You know, you want people to feel good. You want to kill people, right? That's Americans. We don't want to, uh, the average American doesn't want to go slaughter a bunch of people. So he speaks to us with that in mind. But, the way that Israel is, Israel has educated its own people, the way it conducts itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis its minority population, its Palestinian Israelis that are in Israel as Israeli citizens, and also, of course, those in the occupied territories, the contempt that the average Israeli and the government, both, and the military, the, that, that shared contempt that they have for the people inside that are not uh, white Jews, and because they have the same contempt for 
you know, the Ethiopian Jews and some of the, the Moroccan Jews, a little too dark skinned, you know, so they don't get the full, they don't get the full uh, equality thing. Um, that's how Americans, we don't see that. Um, and even I think when Americans travel to Israel, they don't see that. But is, Israel is op, operates that way inside. So when he speaks to, if he says, oh, I just want to transform Gaza into a more peaceful place so we can have a nice little neighbor situation with the Gazans and Israel. That's an American version. When he what he's when he says he's going to transform Gaza to in his Israeli audience in Hebrew, he's not talking about transforming them. He's talking about eliminating them and absorbing that territory under and he's and he has said it in both English and Hebrew that Israel and the IDF will manage the security completely for Gaza. They, he's already said that. He's, he hasn't said forever. He has said indefinitely, um, which is pretty much going to be forever um, if, if the plan goes according to the way they're planning it. But yeah, the, 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 I think uh, transformation means one thing to Americans. Oh, yeah, it'll be more peace and people have, maybe people will get more fresh water and more rights. Okay, that's Americans. We hear that. Israelis hear transformation. They know exactly what it means. It means we're taking land that should have always been ours. We don't know why it wasn't. And again, right before this happened, not unrelated, I'm sure, but right before October 7th, about a week before, um, he, uh, Netanyahu is, got in a little bit of trouble because he was at a UN meeting or something. He held up a map, of course, that showed uh, just Israel and it didn't show Gaza, didn't show the West Bank, showed no territories, no Palestinian land, just showed Israel. Um, in um, in that in that same map, and of course, uh, Americans could, you know, what do we know? Americans aren't the ones pointing this out. The Palestinians are looking at this. The Arab neighbors are looking at this, and of course, it feeds into the fears and doubts that Israel's own neighbors have um, of how contemptuous they are for them. Because I don't know much about the different ethnicities or histories of people, but there's a lot of different kinds of people living in the Middle East. Palestinians um, who were there, you know, in 1948 and got moved off, those Palestinians constitute a category of Arab folk. Well, there's lots of other categories. They're all held in equal contempt. You know, they think the Egyptians are looked up to by by Israel. Israel has nothing but contempt for Egypt. Um, it, it considers Egypt, uh, in fact, I think it has as much contempt for Egypt as it does for Palestinians, because at least the Palestinians will throw stones when they know they're going to get shot for it. Um, Egypt is, is, has come to heal uh, financially and, and otherwise, um, maybe because it had to, but whatever. Uh, the, the contempt that Israel's government and Israelis show Gazans communicates something to all of their neighbors that if you thought you had a good relationship with Israel, think again. You really didn't because you can't trust them. They hate us, whoever us is. That's a, that's a pretty straightforward message. Um, again, you know, I, I, again, it's a strategic error for them to behave this way. There, there are ways to, I don't know if there's compatibility with Zionism per se with the future. I, it, it is, it may be a, in the, in the history of things, it may be a somewhat short-lived, um, ideology, but there's certainly a way for Jews and Muslims and Christians and all kinds of other folk to live together and to work and to prosper because we have historical examples of when this happened. And it certainly happened all around the Mediterranean for many years with, with some spikes of bad things, but they weren't always bad things for Jews. There's bad things for lots of people that happened. Life's not perfect, but that kind of a coexistence is certainly possible. Um, Zionism doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for that kind of uh, coexistence because Zionism is very, uh, I guess, kind of we're better than you. Now, all groups think they're a little better. You know, every group, every club, every family, every clan thinks they're a little better than the other guys. That's just the way human beings are. But Zionism kind of puts that into government laws and regulations and strategies and justice. And in that way, it, it is incompatible with. Uh, it's incompatible with freedom. It's incompatible with uh, human rights. It's immoral in that way, which is why some of the most fervent anti-Zionists are the most religious Jews who who really have a problem with it, and they should. Um, 
so it's it's a problem. But yeah, I I we're, we're watching we're watching history. I don't know how it's gonna. I don't know how it's going to, uh, you know, I feel bad for the people at the receiving end of, of this. Um, I can't imagine, I can't imagine uh, being in those shoes at all. Uh, we have American Palestinians and different news reports are out there of um, people have lost. I saw one yesterday, 30 family members and the home that they were all born in, <laughs> lived in completely turned into rubble. So it does not exist. There is nothing to go back to, which is, part of the strategy to ensure that there's nothing um, to go back to. I don't know, it's, it's pretty evil. Who has the upper hand over the Netanyahu administration to bring them to sanity? It's not China, it's not Russia, it's the United States. Is there any other country that has the same influence on the Netanyahu administration? I don't know if there's other countries that could influence, because I, th- I actually think Russia could do more. Um, and I don't know if they can. It seems to me they might be able to. Um, China could probably do more too, because China supplies the whole entire world with all their parts <laughs> and um, and many of their produced goods. So um, I think Russia and China could do more, but why should they in a way? Because this is an American and Israeli stra- Israel tragedy. It's certainly Israel's tragedy that they're stoking and making worse than it needed to be. Of course, they're, they're digging a hole. It's getting deeper and they're just, they just keep digging. Um, but the United States government, it's well known, <laughs> you know, it is a very pro, uh, it's not just a pro-Israeli government. It is filled with um, people that share Zionism as a faith almost. Um, obviously we don't have Zionism in our country, but um, this concept of like uh, people blessed by God coming to a land and turning it into a land of milk and honey. This is an American thing too, long before Zionism. Uh, you know, the, the the folks that settled our country, uh, very similar in, in a lot of ways. They weren't Jewish, um, but their views were that God has blessed our people and we are the ones to take this land and make it something wonderful. And God is behind us. And it's, we're not the only countries that say God's behind us. You know, it used to be the kings were, were the direct, they were gods, you know. So, but, so, you know, 1600s in the North, in North America, um, people that settled America very much, they, they, they weren't Zionists, but they shared that kind of perspective that God has told us that this is ours to make better. And of course, Zionism, at least on the surface, has that similar theme, that this land is Jews' land and they are the rightful owners of the land and God has said it, um, or the Bible has said it, whatever they, you know, this is the fact. Now, of course, um, much like, you know, these, the, you have the overlaying template of how you justify what you do as a country, but then you also have the political imperatives, you know, and that's not, that's not something that the average person really needs to know about. It's the agenda that the governments have. Now, in our government today, because uh, we don't have that same sense of we were put here to make the country better. We're long past that. 400 years later, that's not part of what America is. We, we we consider ourselves a blessed country, but that's about as far as it goes. We don't, you know, in fact, how many people even go to church anymore in our country? It's not, that's not what motivates Americans. But Zionism motivates many Americans in Washington and DC. It Many Americans in government um, are very uh, intimately familiar and positive about Zionism, which is, uh, you know, Jews, this is their land, they will take it, they will have it, God said it so, and they'll make it profitable and bless God in a result, you know, so it's all good. Um, It is a construct that they believe and it justifies everything. And this is unfortunately, uh, I I mean, I'm not anti-religion at all, but um, many people will say the great wars of the world have all been caused by, you know, religions. Um, because they tell people you should do bad things, but it's because God wants you to. And, um, but yeah, our government is filled with them. And we have, in fact, uh, how many department cabinet head department heads of our major departments of, of the executive branch are uh, Jewish, not just Jewish, but Zionist, pro-Zionist. And certainly the United States has conducted a neoconservative foreign policy, which um, is not necessarily pro or con Jewish folk, but it is very much that if we say something needs to change in another place, 
we'll go over there. It's okay for us to go over there and try to change it. And that is very consistent that neoconservative is a kind of a new colonialism uh, that Americans have been following since really, uh, at least since Reagan's time and, and probably in, since the 50s, probably since the whole end of World War II. But this is very consistent with how Israel views its role in the region. If we have a problem in Jordan, we're going to go do something in Jordan. We're going to go bomb Syrian airports every two weeks, you know, because we have a problem over there and we're going to do that. And that's a very um, interventionist foreign policy. It is a very warlike foreign policy. It's a very arrogant foreign policy. And guess what? Everybody in Washington thinks that's just fine. They like that because that's actually how we conduct our own foreign policy. You know, uh, we, we say, oh, we won a war. Look at look at Ukraine. You know, we drew the line. We didn't send very many troops. We sent plenty of contractors. Um, we spent we sent the CIA, you know, we sent um, a lot of people to help. And then we sent billions of dollars because we think we have every right to go mess with a country, you know, seven time zones away, eight time zones away um, and kill those people. You know, Ukrainians die, Russians die. We count that a plus. Right. Um, that's brutal. And that's neoconservatism. That is exactly what is justified. So there's a shared ideology. And I think it's neoconservatism, but it is very consistent with Zionism in certain ways. That, that uh, there's a better way to do things. God has said it is. The rest of y'all people can shut up because we know better. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to take what we want. Um, yeah. And, and guess what? It doesn't work. The United States empire is ending. And part of why it's ending is because neoconservatism doesn't work. It just, it costs money. It co it creates enemies. And guess what? Our enemies don't want to trade with us. No enemy wants to trade with their enemy. So, you know, we're, we're the world is de-dollarizing. The world is going off the dollar in part because the dollar is not well backed. It's not a good currency anymore, but also because you get a warm feeling when you de-dollarize because now you say, you know, I don't agree with uh, American foreign policy. Guess what? I don't have to use their currency. That's my little thing. One person can do that. I don't have to do that. Um, it's the same with Zionism. And, and of course, Israelis have known this for a long time. That's why they're so sensitive if you don't want to buy their goods uh, or any type of uh, trade blockades or, or boycotts. They're very uh, up, upset about that because they know this is the way that the world will respond when they are unhappy with the country's arrogance and a cup and a country's evil actions. So in many ways, but again, there's not a lot of airspace between Washington DC and Israel. Um, the people who run our government for the most part share Bibi Netanyahu's vision. They share it, they support it. They feel bad because they they see maybe some negatives, you know, but that's, that's as far as it goes. Meanwhile, we send billions of dollars uh, I mean, every year we send billions of dollars, but we have upped that 10 billion. So we've sent three years worth this year. We will be sending in the next six months. So we're part of it. We support it. Our government supports it. Don't don't kid yourself that they don't. When you look at the U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine, in Taiwan, if you were Russian, if you were China, what would you think about this conflict in Gaza? When you look at the U.S. security strategy in which they divide the world in democracies and autocracies. When mm -hmm. they're talking about autocracy, they're talking about China and Russia. <laughs> I think the main goal of this strategy is China and Russia. How we can have some sort of cooperation, these superpowers, instead of working together, are mm -hmm. against each other right now. Both the Chinese and Russians, whether it's the you know Xi and Putin or whoever would run those countries, it doesn't matter because... Um, the people that lead those countries think in a similar way and they think very long term, which is we Americans do not think long term. I don't think we ever have. Um, Israel is a, such a young country. Long term for Israel is it's hard to say. It, it's it's probably they don't think long term either um, as, as a as a political state. They do not think long term. Um, so I think, unfortunately, that Russia and China both look at Ukraine, this idiotic Taiwan policy, um, what's happening in us supporting Israel to kill, uh, to basically murder dark-skinned poor people, which has been something the Americans have been accused of for many uh, decades. 
and Europeans doing the same thing. So I think they see this as almost a necessary playing out of the end of the American empire, which started in the late 1800s and is now coming to an end. They, you know, you have to, those countries, Russia and China and many other countries around the world do think about their country's interests first and foremost. Now, we deny that in this country because we think we're the superpower, global unipower. We are going to uh, make everybody a democracy. Oh, you know, every place we go ends up a dictatorship or whatever. Um, we think that we're going to fix everything else. And we don't think about our what really, how should we define our national interest? Because most of what our country does is not in our national interest at all. Um, what we do domestically is not in our national interest. What we do foreign policy wise is not, ha has not been in our national interest. Russia and China, they, not, they, they know what their country's interests are. And I think they look at the United States as a, uh, a country that is a little confusing in some ways. And we're very militarily powerful, even though our military isn't what it was, we still have many, many nukes and we have really bad leadership in this country. And even you can say, oh, well, we'll get a new president. Well, we've had many new presidents in my lifetime and everyone's been worse than the next. So um, it's, it's really hard to say, will our election system produce a better leadership? And then even then, how long will you have it for? So they have to look at things from a power perspective and America still has great power to do damage uh, to their interests and to the world. Um, in many ways, I think they see us as wasting ourselves and Europe too in Ukraine. And if I, th I, I don't, I can't, I don't, I'm not inside of Putin's head. I don't know what, you know, how he views this, but it seems to me that uh, Russia's uh, really conservative and steady approach in Ukraine has served to drain the United States of uh, many things that we cannot afford as a nation to replace because we're broke, because we owe 33 trillion in current debts uh, around the world and to our own people that we can't pay. So they see almost like the staging of these conflicts, if they can kind of stay at a percolating level and cause us to expend resources and to lose face and to uh, cause ourselves domestic turmoil as a result of it, that this is a good thing. This weakens America um, from a strategic sense even what's happening in Israel does weaken America, certainly. Well, no doubt, because every one of those bombs that they're dropping were made in this country and everybody, that's no secret. So um, this actually drives a wedge, one more wedge, the American support for Netanyahu's war and the takeover and destruction of Gaza. It is a wedge between us and people and countries that maybe China and Russia would like to be closer with. And this will, this will drive Saudi Arabia Qatar, UAE, Iran, Turkey, you name it, Egypt, to people they trust more because they don't trust us. How can they trust us? We kill their people and we, we joke about it and lie about it. Um, so, uh, you know, from there, from a Russian and Chinese perspective, again, unfortunately for the Palestinians, they are the ones paying this uh, direct price. But um, from their perspective, I think it's just like, um, uh, have, have you ever heard the, the, uh, uh, don't throw me in the briar patch. The story of the he he so please no that's not the one. I'm I'm losing my my uh, stories there. But uh, anyway, if you stick tar baby, the idea of a tar baby, right? Have you heard this? this is some deep South American thing. Um, touch the tar, and they got the rabbit to touch the tar, and next thing you know, covered in tar. You can't once you touch it. So you kind of taunt your enemy to go into a quagmire, to get covered in sticky tar, to weaken and, and eventually destroy themselves. Um, from a Russian and Chinese perspective, um, I think they see these, the way we're conducting our foreign policy, it's its own, we are our own worst enemy. Why not just let the Americans totally screw up? Because we are, and we're, we're impoverishing our country. We're uh, ruining our credibility globally. We um, are not repairing our industrial infrastructure at all. We are not securing our own borders. So we are faced with many social 
uh, and um, social welfare concerns in our own country. Meanwhile, we're, we're getting tar, tarred everywhere because we have no sense. And it's, it's in their interest to watch us do that because they are seeking um, to have a different kind of world where the United States doesn't dictate everything, where the United States doesn't threaten everybody. Um, and that world's coming. And I'm a, as an American, I'm like, I wonder what it's going to look like, because it's not going to look like it used to. It's going to be very different. And I think maybe they see the Palestinian sacrifice that's being made uh, as, as something in that same context, which is, uh, which is pretty, that's, that's pretty tragic. Um, you know, it's pretty tragic. And I don't, I don't know. I, that's just one theory. I, I don't know. Maybe um, I haven't really followed what Putin and Xi have, have said. Uh, about this publicly what we know for sure about them is that the solution for this conflict in gaza they were talking about two-state solution we know that the official policy of the u.s as anthony blinken said it in his last meeting with mahmoud abbas is that a viable choice when it comes to netanyahu administration because they don't agree on this two-state solution no no and and neither yeah and neither do the state department people that and the, and the Defense Department people and all the people that are employed for the past 30 years by our government to work towards this two state, none of them believed in it either. Um, it is it is an empty phrase that was used to just push things along, kind of like the Minx Accord in 2014. We didn't mean it. We signed it. We didn't mean it. We just thought we would able to arm Ukraine during those years under this uh, Minx Accord. So, you know, it's like uh, we, we say one thing. Meanwhile, we're pursuing a, a totally different agenda. Um, yeah, this is, so two state, I don't know. They've, I don't know what, part of why Gaza is being decimated, I think, in terms of why Israelis are supporting it, not just that they live in a bubble and they hate Palestinians. Okay, I get that part. But also, you know, they had settled some of, of Gaza and they were forced to remove those Israeli settlements. And that had to be humiliating for the settler movement and the political parties that support the settler movement. So this is payback in many ways. Um, almost the dog in the manger, you know, if they, they may make Gaza totally uninhabitable, contaminate the water supply completely, destroy the country, get rid of all the people. And it won't be something they can immediately resettle with Israeli settlers either. It, it will be a problem, but it'll, it'll be barren. But almost like that's, the anger, you know, that's the, we are going to get back at what happened, not just on October 7th, but when we were told and forced by America and other places to pull our settlers out of Gaza. In the West Bank, where they have settlers, it's so complex and so bifurcated and it's just idiotic. So if you had, you know, if you're going to make two states, you would have the same problem of removing settlers. And um, that creates a terrible political force inside of uh, Zionist Israel. Uh, you know, people would, you know, then that, that will not make them happy. And they will continue to be a little warlike nation that fights with its enemy. Um, so I think the problem is Zionism is not going to allow a two-state solution of any type. And, you know, they said that um, before, I, before Kissinger died, uh, so he was in 99 or 100 years old it was within the past couple of years i can't remember but he talked about um kind of a jordanian um uh, overviewed or over seen like a territory of jordan which would be the west bank but again you have the problem with the settlers but logistically but let's say uh an existing government that was on a peer level with um tel aviv you know a a, a, a Dip, you know, the diplomatic cadre and a military, an organized military, an elective elective process, you know that kind of thing. Um, that 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 could that could be a place for Palestinians to live and prosper, um, kind of like you could say the Donbass, you know, over kind of over uh, seen by Russia perhaps, but still relatively independent because you know the Donbass voted for independence in 2014, or well, they took it, they fought for it, and then uh, voted for it. And then voted for it again, but this kind of thing, uh, you know, how do you how how can people live on territory? How can they function as political units vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors? And so Kissinger was putting forth that kind of an idea. 
And um, again, the only way that that would work for Israel is if Israel said, well, I'm taking over all of Palestine. I will have Gaza. I will completely have, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, which is an Israeli expression, not a Palestinian expression. That is, you know, they, they, oh, you can't say from the river to the sea. What do you mean? They, the Israelis said it first. That's their vision. And that says, well, Israel can have a two-state solution. Palestinians can live somewhere else. That's, I think, the Israeli solution. That's certainly the Zionist proposal. That doesn't work. That doesn't fly. That's not something that is even, it's a no starting. You cannot start from there. And, and uh, I don't think they're capable of doing anything other than that. You know, they don't want to share the property. They hate and despise Palestinians in their schools. You know, they say, oh, Palestinians are taught hatred. Well, I don't know if they are not, but we do know that the Israeli students are taught hatred. We know this because we have many American contacts in Israel and uh, they have Israeli dissidents and Israeli educators who explain how this works. So Israel is not in a position to have a two-state solution that requires it to give up any territory at all. And, and very possibly uh, this whole taking of Gaza is in preparation for uh, what they feel and know is coming, and that is increased pressure for that uh, for that Palestinian state, uh, and they, they're they're not going to allow it. They're not as a, a Zionist country. How would they do that? How would they do that? And who's going to do the labor in the country? They need a su they need a subclass of Arabs and Taiwanese and uh, Thailand people. You know all the different people that work in India in in uh, in Israel much like Saudi Arabia and some of these others, they need a working class to come in and do uh, the labors. So um, uh, it, it's very 1800s, honestly. It's, um, it's how do you fix that? How do, how do you, uh, I don't think Israel is willing and they don't feel, they have nuclear weapons. Why should they have to, you know, we're like that too. All countries with nuclear weapons, there is a wall that you can't you can't push them any further because they do have nuclear weapons. So in Israel's mind, they are equal to all other nuclear uh, weapon countries, and they will not be dictated to. And they don't want to share land, and they don't like Palestinians. Um, how do you how do you have a peaceful solution? So I don't I don't know what the answer is, but um, I do know the two state thing. To me, when I was in the Pentagon you know, 23, four years ago, I worked with folks and one guy that I worked with, um, uh, he's written a couple of books on two state solutions and he doesn't believe in a two state loop. Of course, he's a neocon. He's a, 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 a you know, Israeli dual citizen that worked in the Pentagon. There's many. And, um, you know, he didn't, they don't, they don't believe in this. They're not giving up anything. And it's almost like, um, you know, if, if if you have a farm, you know, and you have animals and the animals start to speak and they say, well, we want we want this part of your farm. You're like, no, you're an animal. I don't share with animals. And that is unfortunately, that is the level of the uh, dialogue. So um, it's very it's very tragic. But justice has a way of happening, even when you don't expect it to happen. So, uh, th again, I think Israel's making a, a huge, you know, they're making a terrible uh not just one mistake, but a mistake upon mistake upon mistake, which will uh, ultimately really harm their country's uh, future, their economy, uh, everything. Do we know any political force in Israel that can confront Zionism in that country? Is that possible in your opinion, that in the future, the population of Israel change this attitude of Zionism and, and go after some sort of settlement, some sort of negotiations? Do you have this hope in the future of Israel? Countries change uh, very often. Any change that happens, it starts with the people, okay? Whether the people have a voice, you know, they say, oh, people are under dictators and they have no voice. People have autonomy, they have agency, even in the worst of situations, even in prison, prisoners have agency, they have ways of dealing with and influencing the power that is over them. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the reasons that they want Palestinians gone in, in mass, gone in mass from Israel, is the fact that they, uh, Israel has a idea of democracy. 
they have democratic elections, they have a parliamentary system with multiple parties and those parties, if they can earn people to sit on the Knesset, then they have lawmakers, they have advocates for the people. And uh, there are, you know, the, 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 the uh, demographics are such that the highly reproducing uh, Arab, Jew, uh, Arab Israelis, uh, little by little, in the long term, this is part of a solution. Um, and the other part of the solution is as uh, pro-war Israelis uh, pass um, away, really. It is generational, and this happens over time. Um, you know, these soldiers, what we've seen with... America can't recruit enough soldiers, and we have a high-tech military. We don't need that many, but we can't recruit the numbers that we need. Why? Because nobody wants to go in the military. Why? Because our military is not something that shares the values of the people anymore, um, and the military does things that people don't want to do. It goes overseas and kills people, and they come back drug addicted or or depressed and uh, suicidal, and that's we don't want that. So you can't recruit. Well. Israel has, of course, the mandatory uh, national service. And when they put these young men and women in positions of uh, killing for their country, which is what the military is about, you kill for the, your country. But th this does not, you can't control that. Um, modern people are connected. You know, we talk about social media, we talk about the global, you know, Everybody's connected, you know, TikTok. Oh, it's Chinese. Who cares? Everybody loves it because we connect with people. Well, the young people in Israel are no different. Many of them are no different than young people in Europe, young people in America, young people in Asia, uh, young people in Russia, I imagine. They're they're not much different. Um, they want to be happy. They want to have a good life. They, they, they don't really want to go. They're not sociopaths. They don't want to go kill people. I mean, obviously a few do. We all, all militaries have their sociopaths, but most of them don't want to do this. And if you put good people in a position like this, at some point, maybe they don't do it right away, but maybe when they're 35 or 40, they have they realize this is not right. What I did was not right. And they want to make amends for it. And that is very much how people often get involved in politics. And we've seen a number of people some for the good, some for the bad, in our own U.S. Congress, who have run for office because they had a military experience uh, that was not something they thought was they could be proud of. And they wanted to shift the foreign policy direction of our country. And then you have some that love to kill, and they're also in the Congress. But again, the change happens internally. It, it's organic. So yeah, there is a great chance uh, in coming decades, that the people of Israel will decide a different path and they will they will move in that direction and they will make their politicians do that. In fact, I'll tell you, for me, when you hear about uh, Bibi Netanyahu's crimes and his uh, elections that were close and different ways that, you know, even, you know, his attack on the judiciary in Israel, it is surprising to me that he was still actually the 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 uh, guy the prime minister because he isn't popular and i think that's something scary for the hard right and i think they realize exactly what we're talking about here that the people are going to decide they prefer peace and prosperity over constant war and constant enemy making and constant condemnation from the world and constant stress from being surrounded by people who you believe hate you and many do and many do hate them and if as they kill these palestinians that increases the hatred level um, both among Israelis and uh, the rest of the world uh, looking from the outside. But uh, yeah, th there's a definite chance that the Israelis can choose peace for themselves. Um, any country can. And uh, uh, and look at what happened in uh, 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 Argentina with their election. You know, uh, Argentina, they've had, the country's had bankruptcies and corruption for three or four generations uh, consistently. So much drama. And they elected a guy, 58% of the vote, which is massive, who says, I'm going to do something very different. Whether he does or not, I don't know. But the people, they're speaking. And, and so this can happen anywhere. Um, and you don't really need elections to do this. If the mood of the people changes, the politicians will respond to that, no matter how, no matter what kind of political system you have. Um, you know, even the kings in the old medieval times, very responsive to 
uh, the, de the demands of the people and, and the requirements of the, the various classes that they ruled over. It wasn't like, oh, I'm, you know, I can do whatever I want. No, nobody can do whatever they want, even Netanyahu. So this will, there's a chance of that and I hope it happens, but, uh, but you can't stop what's happened already. I mean, what has happened already is, um, it's, it's so murderous and so, uh, tragic that, uh, that has to be dealt with. That has to be dealt with. And I don't know, uh, if the world will, you know, if the governments of the world will deal with it, or it will just be all of us who say, uh, kind of like the Amish, we all turn our backs. We will shun Israel. Um, if it comes from Israel, we will not participate. I'm talking about as people, not as governments, because governments uh, don't really represent people a lot of times, and they they do have their own interests. But um, you know, you can't. Every individual makes a difference. Um, so, what's being communicated by the actions of Israel now, and and some of the thoughts about how it occurred and why it's happening and what their agenda is, um, all of that will shape um, the opinion of. Uh, the population of the planet and we'll all decide how we will punish uh who we see as the guilty party here and i'm not justifying hamas's attack but i i would be interested to know um if i can if, if bibi netanyahu himself is partly to blame for what they did um and and why it was undefended certainly that i think that's a legitimate question Biden is in his last year of presidency. If he was in the first year of presidency, he would support Israel the way he did. First off, Biden is a prime example of how the president really isn't running anything. Our government is run by, um, I don't want to call it the deep state, but it's run by professional bureaucrats and politicians and appointees who all come from the same think tanks, and the same uh, political parties in the sense of the leadership of those political parties. And all of them, Republican and Democrat alike, are bought and paid for, unfortunately, uh, by uh, Israeli dollars, whether they are Jewish American donors, like, and, and, and even Trump, Trump uh, very much beholden to um, his, his uh, donors, his pro-Zionist donors. Um, so, Biden now, who is not, who is less capable than he was uh, three and a half years ago or three years ago, uh, he's still not making, the decisions being made are irregardless, ir it doesn't matter who the president is. Um, it's the people that are in the uh, positions of uh, power in Congress, in the Senate. Uh, any congressman who challenges uh, uh, aid to Israel or any other thing that Israel wants uh, including being pro-Palestinian, uh, is going to be uh, politically challenged. They will lose donors. Uh, same thing they, I think, uh, we, we see this with, uh, you know, X or Twitter or Facebook or anytime somebody does something wrong, we'll, the, the advertisers will leave. Same with their Congress. Their donors will leave if they don't comply with uh, what those donors want. And there is a lot of money that rolls around the, the world and many of it is used to buy policy positions. So it's not so much what Biden wants or doesn't want. It is true, um, well, Biden has said he's running for president again. I, we don't know if that will come to pass. He's not very capable, um, but he hasn't said he's not doing it and they're not allowing primaries or anything to choose a, another, another Democrat. So it, it's hard to say what, uh, you know, what world he's living in. But I think regardless of who the next president is, you're going to see that consistency uh, of pro-Israel, pro-Israel's government, pro-Likud really, pro-Likud government policy coming out of Washington. Um, that is a nest, it's a network of um, donors and contributors and think tank people and um, political party heads that all think the same way. They don't think like most Americans, but they think the same way and they are in position to shape policy. Um, if that changed, and it can, it can change because Israel at some point may no longer, uh, people may not want to take Israel's money, partly because of the way they have behaved and conducted themselves most recently. Uh, so uh, this can all backfire on Israel. This is what I'm saying, strategic mistake, uh, of course, but um, 
So things could change that way. But I don't think it has to do with the president. Our next president very likely will be completely uh, pro Israel. I cannot see. In fact, we had uh, the RFK Jr. as a candidate who's very much uh, opposed to uh, uh, many government policies. Of course, his own father was assassinated by, for all, for, for what we can expect, was by our government, um, his uncle by our government. Um, he's very much challenged his government. He towed the line completely on support to Israel. Um, and many of his supporters, in fact, I think one of his uh, key staffers quit over as a result of it because they believe that blind support from Israel really is a, kind of a bought and paid for position of the state. And it's incons if you're going to challenge the state on its other lies, then you should challenge the state on that one. And uh, RFK Jr. did not do that. And so he has a little bit of a credibility gap with some people that would be supporting him otherwise. Uh, but it is possible that things will change and, uh, you know, Israel will not have such a tight hold over our policymakers. Um, I'll tell you, the voters, we'll see what happens in Michigan. You know, if the whole, you know, if several major uh, Arab dominated districts in Michigan uh, go Republican or independent and the Democrats lose them forever, that's big because it only takes a couple of districts to elect a president. So uh, the way our system works. So, um, uh, you know, things will change because the people will change, but it's a slow process. Meanwhile, I don't know who's helping the Palestinians and I don't know uh, if they are, the survivors are pushed into Egypt or, or someplace else. Um, it, I don't have a lot of faith in the UN or any of these agencies, but um, they don't seem to be prepared to take care of the survivors, which to me is insane because there will be, there, there are refugees now and there's going to be more and they don't seem to be uh, preparing for this. So um, again, those are ineffective organizations anyway. This will be one more thing and people will just say, well, uh, the UN doesn't work. We need something else. Um, I don't know what it will be, but nothing stays the same. We will see as a result of what has happened, change will happen. Um, it, it unfortunately it doesn't save any lives right now from what's uh, what's happening there. At the end of the day, when this conflict in Gaza ends, do you see Netanyahu coming out of this conflict victorious, coming out as a hero? How do you see his picture in the aftermath of these events? I think if he pushes all the Gazans out and basically turns Gaza into a moon landscape that cannot be lived on. Um, he will claim that he has solved the problem, a couple of problems. He's gotten rid of the Gazans and he's damaged Hamas. He'll say that. Um, if the right wing remains in power, I think he'll be pardoned for any of his crimes that he's done. And I don't think they'll hold him responsible. But if the people, and Israelis are smart people, they they have access to media like anybody, you know, even though they they're, they're, they're educated in a certain way. They have access to information. Um, if they change their mind and the government uh, moves to a, a, a more rational, I don't know if that's left, center, I don't know what it would be, but a more peaceful party and a more desire for peace and a sense of, it's hard to say, but what the, if the Israeli people feel bad about this, they will elect a new government. If they feel bad enough, they'll elect a new government that will throw Bibi Netanyahu in jail. Um, if they stay, if, if they say this is good, we like it, we feel better now. Um, I think in the right stays in power, the Likud, hard right Likud parties, the groups of parties um, stay in power. I think they'll protect Netanyahu. Now he is, uh, how old is he now? He's in his seventies. So, um, you know, he, he all he needs is some protection. You know, they can, he can go somewhere and live. He's got money stashed everywhere. All of these leaders have money stashed everywhere. So he can, uh, he can survive. Um, it, it remains to be seen. I mean, because the international courts could go after him. He may find himself restricted from travel in many places, just like George Bush was. Remember after the, you know, in many countries that George could not travel to, Dick Cheney could not travel to because they would be subject to arrest when they landed. So uh, I think he'll find that. But it, it really depends on what the people of Israel want. And I think one thing that speaks to this just a little bit, the families of the 
the families of the uh, hostages when there's obviously some have been returned, but they were very vocal, internationally vocal, and they wanted their family members back because we always, that's what we, that's what we all want. You want your family. That's what you care about the most, not politics. You want your family. And they were very much critical of Netanyahu, both for allowing it to happen, which he did, um, perhaps even facilitating it, but also for his uh, response, which seemed to not care about the hostages. And those people uh, and the people that gave them voice and shared their opinions are why there was a truce, because there wouldn't have been one otherwise. It was only because of the political pressure in Israel, because Americans, we have nothing to say about it. As far as Americans concerned, we didn't care. You know, we whatever Bibi wants, Bibi gets. That's the American policy. But it's his own people demanded that. And um, so that tells you the power of common sense uh, people in Israel. Uh, and and some of those people in Israel are, are Arab. I, you know, we have the Palestinian Israelis. Um, so there is hope. You know, peace is what we, everybody says they want. And I think truly deep down we do want that. And I think it will win out.